in my 20s, um, my grandmother had passed and she lived with us. And then I had a car accident. So I fell asleep at the wheel coming home from Boston. It was a quick one of these and I broke every bone in my face and I felt and heard my grandmother. So I literally felt this rush of energy. I yelled out, oh, Maureen. And it, I just was like, Graham? And it was my grandmother, the woman who called 911, said that she was shaken out of a sound sleep. And she heard, go downstairs to the kitchen now and wait. Then she heard the impact and the crash. I was taken to a local hospital where they did a CAT scan. Everything was broken from fractured skull, cheeks, nose, jaw. Had a, a near death. And um, I was transferred to Boston to Mass General. And then they did a second CAT scan the next day. Um, and everything was healed. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Ask Julie Ryan Show. It's where we blend spirituality and practicality to help you live a life of purpose and joy. Maureen Hancock is with us on the show today. You guys are going to love her. She's a world-renowned medium, teacher, holistic healer, and author of the best-selling book, The Medium Next Door, Adventures of a Real-Life Ghost Whisperer. Don't you love that title? It's going to be fun to hear Maureen's thoughts about unknown psychics among us, how to recognize them, and how to develop our own abilities. I'm also going to be asking her about the ghost thing. Please remember to subscribe, leave a comment, and share this episode with your family and friends. Now let's go chat with Maureen. Maureen, I'm so thrilled to have you on the show. Welcome, welcome. Thank you. I'm so excited. Thanks for having me. You bet. We met at the Helping Parents Heal Conference last summer in Arizona, and it was so much fun watching you on stage, talking to everybody and bringing in spirit. And you just had everybody in stitches. But I know, you, I know you're a comedian by training, right? Yes, I used to do stand-up in Boston, if you can tell the wicked awesome accent. But I do like to bring levity to such an overwhelming subject matter. Yeah, because that was a, a room, big ballroom full of people who've lost a child. And you were providing so much comfort when you'd say, okay, here's a kid who's wearing like a red sweater with a bicycle on it. And, he, and he's, you know, so excited and he's given some, some piece of information that the parents knew exactly that was their child. And everybody was just howling when you were, you were up there helping all of those parents. Yeah, because when they laugh, like their aura extends and then it opens up the lines of communication because most people think like, oh, I can't laugh and I can't have joy. And it's the opposite. They want you to feel that because it actually brings you closer to them. Well, I find that, too, when I'm working with families who have a loved one in spirit. And, and I don't know about you, but my families are always expecting some earth shattering esoteric, life-changing commentary from their loved one in heaven. And they're like, hey, I miss strawberries. <laughs> something that's just hilarious. They'll come up with something hilarious that's very vanilla, you know, nothing earth-shattering. And, you know, get it, they'll get them laughing pretty quickly. Do you find that the same oh, thing? Yeah, totally. Like, and I'll take on their personality. So and say things that they would say and, and just kind of act like them, like, hey, what's up, what's up, what's up? And just they're like, oh, yeah, that's him or that's her. And, um, and, and right now I feel like, and you must feel this, the veil is very thin between here and the other side. So it, it literally is like a telephone line. Hello, collect call from heaven. Yeah, exactly. Why is it thinner now, do you think? Well, a few things. I feel like uh, because we've had so many solar geomagnetic storms, and that's why I'm in the Boston area, as I mentioned, and we saw the aurora borealis, the northern lights, and all along the east coast, because these magnetic storms are at the highest level they've been in years. So that's doing it. And then the Schumann resonance, which is like the Earth's vibration, is, uh, which is usually really positive it's kind of taken a little bit of a turn so it's like the collective you know and but we can turn this frown upside down and 
And you can collect, you, I'm teaching people, you do too, to connect directly that you don't need me. You are the overseas operator. You hold the key. Exactly. Yeah. And I think we all come in with the ability. Would you agree with that? Yes. And then life gets in the way and we talk ourselves out of it and we try too hard or we're so heavy in our grief that we, we need to learn how to remove layers. And I have a wellness studio and I teach yoga and Tai Chi and Qigong and nervous system reset. And I think it really does take some work for you if you're stuck in your head to lead with your heart and not your head. Well, and especially when somebody's in grief, because it's such a low vibration. And I always say spirit doesn't communicate on the I feel crappy channels because the vibration's too low. You, I yeah. Love yeah. So it's like they're listening to the country music station when they're in grief, then they're whining about mama, the truck and the dog. And then they need to be on the disco station or the, you know, you can't listen to disco music and not be in a good mood. It's just not possible. Celebrate good times. Come on. Exactly. Even, you know, even our kids who roll their eyes with the disco stuff, they, I, I go, I, I challenge you to listen to two disco songs in a row and be in a bad mood. It's not possible. You're right. Yeah. And they speak to us through music. So those words are very poignant when, when it comes on unexpectedly. And it's like, wait, are they trying to tell me something? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you think about all lyrics and all music and all, all books and all movies and screenplays and all that stuff's all channeled anyways. So I, I use lyrics and songs a lot in my training because there's so much amazing information in the lyrics of a song not to mention the musical notes but the lyrics as well do you find that oh totally and just um different vibrations so you know tuning into different frequencies and not just like just music and i'll put on when i can't sleep like a certain frequency to help me like calm the nervous system and and music does that, but it when you smile and laugh and your aura extends outside of like right here, you're open you're opening up to more possibilities. Yeah. Back to disco, funny aside, I was a sorority advisor at the University of Alabama for a dozen years. And they have date parties with fraternities and stuff where they dress up. And I happened to be at the house one night and there's four hundred and fifty girls in the chapter. <laughs> and they were having disco night. So they were all dolled up, you know, going to this party, dressed up as disco. And I said, I lived during the disco era. We didn't dress like that. You guys, I don't know where you're getting your information. But, and then when they, when I saw them a couple of days later, a lot of them said, you were right about the music. I said, you guys are going to have such a ball because the music is so fun to dance to. And it just puts you in a good mood. Yep. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Speaking of good moods, I love the name of your book. I laughed so hard when I read it. It's uh, The Medium Next Door, Adventures of a Real Life Ghost Whisperer. That is hilarious. Did you come up with that? So I did. And um, and because I, it is just like hanging out with me, I'm just like the gal next door, you know, just a regular down to earth person. And then my producers on the pilot that I had on TV at that time were the Ghost Whisperer producers. So it kind of like, I was like, hmm, this will go together, especially the pilot was called Psychic in Suburbia. So, but, um, so yeah, and, and we could talk about that in a little bit, but they tried to make me into Melinda from the Ghost Whisperer and that just didn't work. You remember I, that I've show? I've never seen that show, so I don't know anything about uh, her. Okay, yeah. It was on for probably 10 years. Yeah, James Van Prague was an executive producer. He came up with the idea, and then it was on ABC. Oh, wow. Wow. I remember The Good Witch, which I loved. Did you ever see that? That was, uh, I don't know what channel that was on. We watched it, you know, on Netflix with the reruns and stuff, but. That's the only one that we binge watched of that, but I haven't seen any of the other ones. So are there really psychics next door in neighborhoods? If everybody can communicate with spirit, do you think there are closet people like us that haven't come out of the, out, of, out in the open yet? 
they coming out of the woodwork. So for, for that title, it was me. I was the psychic in suburbia, just going around and, you know, reading people. And this was before like Lisa Williams and Teresa Caputo and all that way back in the day. And so, um, it, and I don't do attack readings, but they would have me just walk up to somebody in the street and, oh, you know, your grandma's a fan. But, um, but now that I am in menopause and have a stronger voice, uh, I say no to things now. I'm like, no, that's not authentic for me and that doesn't work for me. So it feels empowering. I saw one of those shows. It was a clip. It must have been on social media. And one of those psychics was trying through mcdonald's and said oh your grandma your dead grandmother is behind you and she's got a message for you and somebody said to me is that how it works for you and i said no that's tv magic you know i don't think people do that is that what you're talking about with the attack psychics mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i've never yeah. heard it called that way do you turn your abilities on and off or do you do you walk around and you can see dead people everywhere oh no 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 i turn it off and so it's been 28 years now. And at first I didn't know how to turn it off. And it was all the time. And when my kids were young, you know, I, I say I was um, raising children and raising the dead. And I'd be at a soccer game and I'd look over and like, I'm her mother. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm not doing that. And so I learned how to zip up and turn it on and off. And now it's very natural where, you know, I have to flip the switch. Yeah. Yeah. I turn mine on and off too. I don't walk around scanning people. I I just I just want to live a regular life and in a crowd of people, how obnoxious would that be? Well, this one's got that going on, this one's got this going on and and all of that. How do you turn your abilities on and off? So, you know, in, in the beginning when I didn't know how, I, you know, I would actually say like at my intention like I am closed I need sleep I need you all to leave me alone and go away and God bless you and then when I want to turn it on I'd be like I'm welcoming you know the spirits of the highest uh, white light and pure and to assist this person and now it's just natural I don't do or say anything it's just when I'm a regular gal I'm just a regular gal and that's it you know but when I'm out with my husband um, people do come up to us quite a bit and he's used to it, but I have had to learn boundaries and to say very nicely, like, you know, we're eating or this is dinner and thank you so much, but you know, get lost. Well, or go, here's my website, you know, schedule an, an appointment if you want. Yeah. Kind of a thing. Me too. It's, I turn it on and off in a nanosecond. I, I always say it's, Attention, intention. It's another mm. AI acronym Love in artificial them. intelligence, but attention, where my attention goes and what my intention is. I'm going to scan you medically and see what's going on. Or you want to talk to your dead grandmother in heaven, or you want me to scan one of your dogs or something like that. It's where I put my attention, intention. And then as soon as my attention is off of that, it shuts it off in a yeah. nanosecond. So yep, that same. works. That works really well, too. And I think it's important for people to know that their techniques are going to come in and they're going to be perfect for them. Because what works for you may not work for somebody else. What works for me may not work for somebody else. But we're all going to come up with our own methodologies that make it easy for us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and having our strong points and in the beginning, I only thought I was clear audience and I could just hear and that's it. And just, you know, a shaman I was working with, he's like, you know, you have all the abilities and all the clairs and you can tune in. And I'm like, oh, no, I just hear. So over the years, I realized, you know, it's a little bit of everything. But my strong point is clear audience. Yeah. Well, I have found that it comes in the easiest for us in the way that we learn anything. I'm a visual learner, so I see things, I hear things, I feel things, I know things, all of that. And it's been my experience, too, with my students that everybody has the ability to do it all, but we're always going to get the easiest way for spirit to communicate with us first. And then the other stuff is there as well. So right. I think it's kind of fun. All right. Back to the ghost whisperer stuff. What is a ghost? 
And are they different from a spirit or a soul? Well, I I don't really believe that um, houses are so much haunted as there is an imprint of energy. And so I don't subscribe to like ghosts. I don't use that in my language. And, um, you know, spirit is your spirit loved one. So uh, this spiritual being having a human experience that has slipped out of the leased vehicle and the lease is up, but the driver continues and that is spirit. And um, an interesting question my sister asked me because her son passed suddenly and tragically at 19. She's like, what is the difference between the spirit and the soul? And I'm like, well, I feel because she said, what if we all get there and he's reincarnated or come back? And I know I'm jumping ahead here, but I said, you know, that spirit imprint is always there in that experience, right? And that love and that connection. And then I feel like the soul can keep coming back to learn and grow and reincarnate again. And um, so, so that's, that's where I'm coming from. What do you yeah. think? Well, for me, a ghost is a spirit. I use the word spirit and soul to mean the same thing. Spirit feels less religious to me because I went through 12 years of Catholic school. So soul to me is religious. It feels religious. Spirit feels more universal to me. Although when a plane goes down with passengers, they'll talk about how many souls are on board, not how many people which I think is interesting. Did you know that? Yeah. 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 And I forget what the reason is why, but it's souls instead of people. It may have to do with like, maybe there's a casket with somebody's body in there or something. Cause a lot of times those are used to be transported in the cargo section of planes. If somebody died, (laughs) by the way, one of my best friends, this is funny now. I mean, it wasn't funny at the time, but her dad died in Florida. They had his casket with his body in it shipped back to Ohio. The airline lost it for two weeks. No. Honest no. to God. Honest to God. They had to keep pushing the funeral back because the casket was lost. How do you lose a casket? It's like fine Waldo in the casket. Like what? That's when you need a psychic to come in. I know. So, uh, you know, she, we laugh now about it. She says those little devices that Apple has that you can put in your luggage and you can you can uh, monitor where it is. And I just said, she said, oh, we need one of those for my dad. I said, yeah, I guess. But I digress. Um, the, the thing about the ghost for me is it's a spirit that has gone to heaven and they want to continue exploring that past lifetime kind of with one foot in the spirit world and one foot in the human world. Mm. So like when we come in, you know, we forget a lot of the spirit stuff so we can have the human experience. Well, it's been my experience that they do the same thing because I've seen ghosts. I've talked to them. I've worked with them. I'll normally bring in another deceased loved one of theirs that will help them go on into the light and go, okay, no, really you're dead. And really here's your loved one. Fun story. One of my dear friends one time had, she told me, she called me, she said, I had an evil spirit come through my front door. And she knows I don't believe in evil spirits. I say all spirits are pure love. So I said, well, what'd you do? And she said, I got a golf club out of the umbrella stand and I was getting ready to hit it. And I said, well, did you really think it was going to work with a spirit that, you know, kind of if you swung the golf club, it'd go right through them, don't you think? And she said, well, yeah, I didn't think about that at the time. And so I said, let's do an instant replay. And we did. And it was this guy who was a Civil War fatality. He was a Confederate soldier who died in the war. We got his name. We got where he was from. We got all that stuff we were able to corroborate with historic documentation online. And he was looking for his daughter. His daughter had reincarnated as my friend's daughter. And we got her name and we got, you know, all this stuff. So I pulled in the daughter's spirit, got them reconnected he went out into the light and he was fine. And I've watched that happen several times. 
So that then leads to the conversation of, do we live multiple realities concurrently? And is part of our spirit, like in our current bodies and living on a planet far, far away and living in a past life? And is it all at the same time? Yeah. And does that make your head want to explode? Yes. Yeah. And you're the first one that has ever said that to me. That's in the same line, you know, as me, the work with, yeah, it's all happening simultaneously. And I'm still trying to figure that out. You probably are too. But, you know, the past, present, the future is all happening right now, which on some deep level makes sense to me. But I just still need to like wrap my brain around it because I spent so many years teaching, you know, doing past life regressions and and yes, that was all part of the experience, but it collectively is all right here, right? Yeah. Yeah. There was a, somebody that submitted a question online, and I, I'll choose a question each week and do a blog about it. And this person stayed in a haunted hotel in some place in Nevada, like out in the old Western town someplace, one of the most haunted hotels supposedly in the country. And she saw a figure of two people come in dressed in like early 20th century clothing and and all of that. And she said, what was that? Who were they? What was going on? And so we got the information about them. And, and she said, well, so why was I seeing it now? And I said, the thought that I got and see if this resonates with you was that it's kind of like you can watch a movie on Netflix that was filmed 40 years ago and it's current, but you're watching it, you know, in the future of something that happened in the past, but it seems like it's still current. And so that's what was going on. And it was the hotel manager and his assistant, and she was holding a clipboard and she had on a long skirt and one of those high collar blouses, you know, that they wore like at the end of the 1800s. Her hair was in a Gibson girl hairdo on top of her head. And we got their names and stuff. And we were able to, she was able to locate that that was a past manager of the hotel. Wow. So, I don't know. Does that make sense as far as a, oh, 100%. And an I, explanation? Yeah. That's a great um, analogy and explanation. And I've, I've never put it that way myself, but that just makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And so how do we tell the difference between a ghost and a spirit? So I, I don't use the term ghosts, but I know that you do. So, um, I, I just feel, I don't feel that anyone gets stuck. That's where I, I don't either. Okay. I don't either. Okay. Yeah. No, I think the ghost is experiencing this, not in a bad way, but in a way that they've chosen, much like we decide what we want to do in our next lifetime. Mm. Mm. So I'll have to explore that more. But, um, you know, I've just always, do I see, you know, figures and shadows and whatnot? And, you know, maybe that is the ghost. Uh, but I've just always used the term spirit, spirit, spirit. Yeah. 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 Why do you use spirit instead of soul? Well, I mean, I'll use soul too, but sometimes I might, like somebody has said to me, um, so, you know, what if they reincarnate and then I get to the other side, heaven, whatever you want to call it, and they're not there. And then I say, yeah, but that energy, right? If you talk in terms of like quantum physics and energy cannot die, be destroyed and that energy exists. And then I liken that to the spirit, right? And then the soul, this is just my thinking, but can come back and uh, go through some more learning and growth and trying to reach enlightenment and learn all these lessons. But um, And then when I teach my yoga and my uh, qigong and I say, okay, you know, I've studied Chinese medicine. Oh, the gallbladder. Oh, I don't have one, somebody says. I said, yeah, but the energy still exists. So it's almost like the spirit of the gallbladder, like people with um, you know, an amputee can still feel their leg. So the energy continues and exists. So that's, that's why I talk a lot about spirit and energy. Um, but I, I feel the soul is the ultimate, you know, is the driver, right? Mm -hmm. 
yeah, that's called phantom pain when people have pain in their in the limbs that have been amputated, and we think what? But there's tons of research on that that that's a real thing. And I say, hey, just like your spirit loved ones, that energy still exists. It's just taken a different form, but the energy's still there, but the physical isn't there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. How do spirits communicate? With me personally or everybody? Yeah, yeah, with you. So with me, um, so Claire audience is my strong point, so they will just talk to me. And then I feel on my body, like Claire sentience, how did you pass? And I feel it, or they'll show me. Or maybe, you know, today I had a connection where, um, you know, it was Alzheimer's. So they're saying like, oh, I kept saying, how'd you pass? How'd you pass? Let me feel it. So I don't know what that feels like. So I couldn't decipher it until they said, I'm whole again. I'm whole again. And then they understood like, yeah, they had Alzheimer's. I can understand that. And then, um, and then I'll see things in my database. So it'll be, uh, you know, like a Navy ship, or I'll see all my symbols and everybody has a card catalog, right, that they can pull out and draw from. So I'm mostly hearing, um, I have medium friends that can describe them to a T and that's not how, how it's not my strong point. Although dogs come in and I can be like, this is a Weimarina. This is it because I studied small animal science. I trained dogs. I was a vet technician. To see how that's like in my database, right? So that's how I communicate. Yeah. yeah. And I've heard you say many times, okay, slow down, slow down, because the spirit is talking to you and they're so excited that they can communicate with you and you can then in turn communicate with their loved ones who haven't learned how to do it directly with their, perhaps their child in heaven. And and I've heard you say many times, okay, 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 calm down, slow down. What's going on? Right. And so what I teach everybody to say to spirit is this, slow down your energy, come closer, make it more obvious so that they don't realize like we can coach them a little bit. They don't, especially in the beginning, they don't know they're too fast outside of the physical body. So I will help them. And, and I teach a lot of folks like tell them to slow down. Because they don't know. They go like this and slow down. Well, my name's Michael, you know, and yeah. slow down. Why do you think that is, that they go so much faster? Yeah. When we come out of the physical body, because it's so dense and it's so heavy and it's so third dimension, suddenly they're catapulted out of their body and it's light in the light body and it's fast and beautiful and amazing and you know, I do, I've been doing hospice work for many years and witnessed so many passings where, you know, they're so heavy in the body and then they, oh, and they come out and they, they're like, I feel free. And then it, it's like trying to tune into an AM radio, like, because they're so much lighter now, right? Right. Yeah. Right. I do a lot of medical, intuitive and energy healing work. And when I've got somebody on my radar, I'm like a human MRI. And when I have somebody on my radar, the information is coming in so fast. And I'm watching the healing in my mind's eye. And I'm getting information downloaded into my head. I call those divine downloads. And I'm talking with my client to describe it. And I always say, good thing I'm a girl because I can multitask. Because the information does come so fast that uh, I find myself, and I talk fast most of the time anyways, but I really talk fast when I'm scanning somebody. Ooh. So you're the first person that I've heard talk about that, that the information comes in super fast and you almost have to kind of slow down the speed a little bit on, um, on getting it in. So sometimes I'll, I'll tell people that you know, hang in there. If you need me to clarify something, I will. Also, I've found that too, when I'm working with a family, I worked with a family yesterday whose husband slash father had passed recently, and it was the wife and three daughters. And I always tell families, okay, we're going to start the conversation. And it's like pumping a water well on the farm 
once you pump it and the water starts flowing, then they get really chatty. But we just start the conversation and then and then they're just like off to the races. Do you find the same thing? Ah, I love that you said that. I'm like, gosh, uh, that's amazing. Because it is like, you know, first they have to get to know the medium. Are you the right fit for me? Do I want you to be my voice? Hmm, hmm, hmm. And then we have to get on the same page of how my symbols come in, or I might just hear words or conversation. And um, we are the ceiling fan and they are the helicopter propeller. So I teach, how do you raise your vibration so that you can meet in the middle and, you know, through all kinds of, of things, you know, walking, tree bathing, grounding, doing some Qigong, um, conscious breathing, all the things so that you can raise it up. And then I tell them, slow it down. And, and then we click probably right when you get that the water flow. And I love that. Great analogy. And I find too, that they all have ADD because they're talking about stuff that's like all these different topics and they're just coming in with stuff. And you know, this, who's Henry, who's, you know, they're showing me this bass player in a bluegrass band. And then the next thing they're talking about playing basketball and the next thing that I, and so I tell the families, I go, just, you know, it's like, just consider they don't have any constraints. It's like, they all have serious cases of ADD and they're just going to come in with the stuff that, um, won't necessarily be in order according to how we think of it from a human perspective. But do you find that oh the same God. thing? I want to borrow that. That's amazing. Can I borrow that? Yeah. Yeah. It's very ADD. And some of them are ADHD, right? Attention deficit heaven disorder. Yeah. It's just yeah. Boom, bang, boom. But yes. Oh, 100%. It's like, oh, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I had an antique car. Blah, blah. Oh, you just got a job offer. Oh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, did the puppy, the puppy died. Oh, he's right here. His butt. Yeah. yeah. And, and I'll try to get some sense of order where it's going to come in all choppy, but I'm going to quickly put the piece of the puzzle and I need help from, you know, this sitter and, um, and have it be, make sense and come together. And at now I'm to the point where I, okay, I know this means that, this means that, this means that, and then we can help it flow better, of course. Right, right. I had somebody a couple of days ago, and when I work with private clients, I say I'm a buffet of psychicness, so we can talk to your dead grandma, I can scan you medically, we can talk to your cat, you know, I mean, fast life, whatever, and we cram as much into the time we have together as possible. And so we, I had done a medical scan and then we'd done this gal's dog, you know, her dog had something going on. And then we get to her, her deceased grandmother, I think. And, uh, and I said, she's talking about Aunt Edna. Who's Aunt Edna? And she said, well, yeah, that was my grandmother's sister and all of that. And all I could think of was Bewitched and Aunt Agnes or who was the, who was the aunt in Bewitched that she'd call him in? Aunt Agatha. Samantha Esmeralda. Was was that who it was? The the it aunt does, that was just, did, she I'm was kind strong. of she was kind of had a little dementia or something. She got confused. Do you remember that aunt? It might be Esmeralda. I'm gonna look it up. Yeah, yeah. but there are shows like that, and, and without your show that you did, I want to talk about that in a second. That I find that some of these screenwriters. They're psychics because there's they get so many things right in their TV shows of things that I've experienced and things that I know you've and uh, you've experienced and our colleagues have experienced. And I think, OK, they got somebody who's really a medium that's writing the screenplay to this. Have you found that, too? Yeah. And, and I was brought in on a couple of projects where, um, you know where the person was going to play a medium. So they would hire me to consult with them. And I did that with, um, oh my God, some big celebrity and he was going to play a medium and, um, oh my God, a Jack, um, oh my God. Anyway, he's pretty famous. And, um, and so he would, I would teach him, this is what it's like. This is what you have to do. Oh, should I do this? Don't do that. That's not right. So they will get medium consultants for sure. Yeah. Mm. All right. 
So tell us about your journey in becoming a psychic medium. Have you always been able to do this as a little kid? What's what's the story behind the comedian that turned into a psychic medium? Right. So um, as a child, I had lead paint poisoning. And this was back in the day when everything was lead paint based. And so you know, I'm one of nine, grew up just outside of Boston and I chewed the windowsills watching my siblings play outside and everything was lead paint. So I slipped into a coma. I was in Children's Hospital in Boston for three oh, wow. years. For so how long? Three years. It's terrible. Not I, stop? No, I was in for one year. I was in a coma for a few months. I had brain shunts and encephalitis. And then they created at Boston Children's, and this was in 1969. Um, so I went in at, no, 60 some 1969. I was two years old when I went in. Uh, chelation, so, you know, removing heavy metals. So Dr. Grafe, Boston's Children's Hospital, worked with scientists and doctors, and they started to remove the, the lead from my blood. But um, so I was in for a year, and then I would be, I'd get to go home a little bit at a time. Then I came home at five years old, and I saw spirits walking around the house, going through the walls, dressed as what I can only describe as pilgrims. So they had that kind of garb on, and it was scary. And it was there, I well, my home very old. It was, uh, you know, on the historic, you know, colonial. It was very old, and um, and then they would say like, "Oh, it's just the medication," because I'd be yelling and like, "Oh!" And I'll never forget that dogs. Wild dogs would uh, surround my bed and be like barking like crazy. That's when they thought like I was imagining it. And uh, but then I started to say things to like my mother, like, oh, you know, this statue is in the back closet or this and that. How do you know that? As a teenager, so I shut it off like most do around six years old. And as a teenager with hormones, I noticed that it started to come back like around 17, 18 years old. Um, and then in my 20s, um, my grandmother had passed and she lived with us. And then I had a car accident. So I fell asleep at the wheel coming home from Boston. And um, it was a quick one of these. And I broke every bone in my face and I felt and heard my grandmother. So I literally felt this rush of energy. I yelled out, oh, Maureen. And it, I just was like, Graham? And it was my grandmother, the woman who called 911, said that she was shaken out of a sound sleep. And she heard, go downstairs to the kitchen now and wait. Then she heard the impact and the crash. And um, I was taken to a local hospital where they did a CAT scan. Everything was broken from fractured skull, cheeks, nose, jaw, 30 stitches down the middle. Had a, a near death. And um, I was transferred to Boston to Mass General. And then they did a second CAT scan the next day um, and everything was healed, but they couldn't understand it because I should have had emergency surgery. I had, um, you know, a cerebral hemorrhage and a hole and all this crazy stuff. And um, I didn't need anything done. And then I started to hear. So instead of seeing them as a child, I started to hear. And it was it caused a lot of anxiety. I, I had terrible panic attacks. I wanted no part of it. And um, and then I started to work with a shaman and started doing all my holistic studies and um, went to Boston Shiatsu School and the New England School of Acupuncture. And I opened, I, I was getting ahead of myself. So then I was working at Logan Airport when 9-11 happened. So that was the turning point for me. I couldn't take it. I was just, I would walk down next to the tarmac and just the feeling, it was just so heavy. And I started, I went out on a limb because I was hiding my abilities. Oh, I couldn't tell people. And um, I started a widow's group for 9-11 for people around Massachusetts. And then um, I, I was litigation manager there and I quit my job. I started my dream. I you know, to do heal healing. I um, started a cancer foundation, Manifest a Miracle. 
and working with children with cancer, but working with end stage, any kind of end stage, not just cancer. And um, my mom was the head of hospice, so I brought um, not alternative, but complementary healing into hospice when it wasn't there. So Reiki and meditation and, you know, just helping people not be so afraid to physically leave. Right. Right. Okay. That's a lot to unpack. First of all, I want to know who your plastic surgeon is because you look amazing. Thank you. None. I had none. I, I mean, if I go like that, you can see my scar here, but it, it was a, yeah, I've never been to plastic it's a miraculous. surgery. miraculous. It was miraculous. Yeah. And I'm almost 60 and I have had nothing done. And I don't mean, but, 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 you know, I feel like energy work and you look young and amazing energy work, you know, it keeps us young and vibrant. Do you agree? Yeah. Because the, cause we're swimming in the high vibe all the time. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Yeah. So NDE, what happened? So, um, so this is interesting because it's not like your typical, like I didn't see the big white light. What, what happened was, um, I saw, so my grandmother came to me, but we were in a thatched cottage in Ireland, which was her farm. And all these people were around her in her bed and she was speaking in tongues, which she didn't do here. And I, I just remember, and they all, and I was like, what is this? And then she said, Maureen, there's somebody here for you. Jesus. Oh, wow. And then the Blessed Mother was at the foot of the bed. And all of a sudden, she's, my grandma was like, are you ready? And now my fiance at the time said, you know, I was dead. And then all of a sudden, and I do remember this part that I was thrust. I was like this, like, so the Blessed Mother came through my body. And I remember going, like that, like I was thrust back into my body and it hurt. I remember that it hurt. It was like, no. And I remember that, that guilt feeling of like, it just felt so amazing. And I, you know, that's when I was working after that with cancer patients passing and every single one of them would be like, it's amazing. And then they would pass. And that's what I felt like. It's just like the best feeling ever. Yeah. Did your grandmother say the rosary a lot? Yes. She's standing there when you were telling the story and she had a rosary in her hands. Oh, always. Yeah. I call sweet. it the bead squeezer. <laughs> you, you can borrow. Yeah. Yeah. She's got a rosary in her hand. Yeah. Oh, well, you were so close to her and still are. But with all those kids... Are you named after her or something? What's going on there? Well, um, a derivative. So, you know, well, my grandmother was Margaret and the other one was Mary. And everybody in Boston Irish is Margaret Mary, Mary Margaret. And um, I'm Maureen, derivative of Mary. So, yeah. So kind of sort of like, and I'm one of nine. So there's a lot of Mary and Margaret. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds, it's funny you say that that's a Boston thing because that's a Southern thing. A lot of, lot of two first names down here. You got Mary Margaret and Susie, Susie Leo, Lee, Susie Lee and, and uh, Catherine Maybelline. And yeah, I mean, it's hilarious. Some of these names. Yeah, Anna Kate grew up next door to us. And that, there are a lot of that. So I think it's interesting. You know, that that's um, a Boston thing and a Southern thing. But the South is very historic, like Boston, too. I always talk to people about Charleston when they'll say, well, what do you think of Charleston? And I'll say, it's like, it's as historic as Boston, but it has better weather and manners. Oh, right. Yeah. And it's true because, you know, the Southern manner thing. So there's that. Oh, my gosh. You talk about... um that we need to unblock the clutter, I'm using air quotes, in order to communicate with spirit. What do you mean by that? So I think so many people want to connect and create their own non-physical relationship with their loves and spirits, and they get in their own way. 
So we're overthinkers and our nervous system is shot and we tend to eat like crap. And there's a lot of variables to open up to spirit. And it will be, you know, doing the work where you're, you're leading with your heart and not your head. You know, how many people do you know say like, please, I need a sign. I want a sign. Show me, help me. I need. And I say, change the language, change your language and you'll change your energy. So, so that if you change the language and you say, hey, if you can, you can come in if you can, instead of demanding, there's no on demand button to the beyond. And, um, so doing the work to get uncluttered and eating clean and trying to cut out dairy, cut down on sugar and inflammation in the body and trying to take better care of your gut health. And when that all comes together and the energy's flowing right and you're doing your walking or meditation, then you are a clearer channel to receive because you have raised your vibration doing all that backup work. That's the first time I've ever heard anybody say that about physical health being an important component of being able to communicate with spirit. But it makes tons of sense because the inflammation in the body, sometimes I'll get somebody on my radar and I'm like a human MRI, Maureen. And I'll, I'll, the first thing I'll see when I get them on my radar is they look like snow on a malfunctioning TV or computer monitor screen. Do you remember back in the day when the TV stations would turn off at the end of the night and they'd play the national anthem and then there'd just be snow on the screen? That's what some people's energy field looks like when I first get them on my radar. And so I'll ground them first so that I can get the snow removed or the static. And then I can go in and I can see body parts and organs and bones and jazz like that. But it's interesting because I would say in most cases, there is a gut thing going on where their diet is less than optimal. They don't exercise. They don't really, they aren't taking care of their body. And yeah. So yeah. keeping rhythm is off. And think about like, because we are vibrating um, pieces of energy, I guess, right? So everything that isn't sort of going well in that whole picture we just talked about is is lowering your vibration so that you want to be at the highest you can be to to be like oh here's my antenna i'm ready yeah you see yeah. you guys she's got these three dogs and what kind are they tell everybody so i have um i have this is my lab a rec you know, he was 140 pounds he lived in a cage for three years Oh my, what's his name? This is Baxter. Mando. And this is Mando. He was dumped behind a Mexican restaurant at three weeks old and survived for six months. And this is Lily, my queen Lil. Lil, can you see her? Hi, Lil. Oh, isn't she beautiful? So, yeah. And my son, um, so he has a liver disease and he wanted a dog. And he said, I said, what, what do you want? And he said, a dog from Game of Thrones. So I couldn't find a wolf, but I found a husky. So, <laughs> Oh, I love that. We had a pet psychic on a couple of weeks ago, and she had a wolf uh, husky mix. I think it was a wolf husky, and she had a coyote. No, it was a wolf German shepherd mix and a coyote German shepherd mix. And she said that coyote was okay, but the wolf was just, it was too, too much wild, um, wow. too much wild energy and in the bloodline and stuff. She said he never attacked anybody, but it was close a couple of times. And so good, good decision to forego the wolf, at least, you know, yeah. in the and situation. And I was a dog trainer and, you know, like I said earlier, vet tech and like, Dogs are better than a lot of people, honestly. Listen to you. <laughs> All right. What is it about your abilities and about your life so far that's drawn you to working with people at the end of their lives? So when I was five years old and when I came home from the hospital, my mom, before she passed, would always tell the story that since you were five years old, you 
everyone would ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you said, I want to work with people with cancer. So even at five years old, I knew. So I had to have come into this experience uh, just wanting to touch people and help them not be afraid of death and to lay my hands on them and to help the families left behind. And I'm finally writing my second book. And so um, sort of a working title is What to Expect When Expecting Death because we have the What to Expect series to bring life in. What about that guidebook to help, right? The before, during, and after of death, right? The process, hospice, all of it. And just to assist people um, because uh, so many reach out to me and they're like, what do I do? What do I do? And so I go and I help them to understand the dying process, what's going to happen, what to expect, but also maybe setting up signs or making a beautiful celebration of life before the party after they go, mm -hmm. you know, putting on beautiful music, teaching them how to give massage and light touch and aromatherapies and um, just not fighting and mm -hmm. creating a space that they can slip out peacefully instead of everybody yelling and they can hear and da, da, da. like we want to create um, just a beautiful space so that so they can physically step out because it's hard when they have a strong heart people always say like how come we're telling them it's okay to go and they're not going i'm like well they really have left already and it's the physical catching up because it um, takes a lot for that super strong heart to finally you know shut down so they can slip out yeah. When somebody was in that position when my mother was still alive, we, we used to joke and we'd say, you need to go light one of those killer candles in church. And she'd go light one of the votive candles, you know, in front of the Virgin Mary altar or St. Joseph's altar. And inevitably they'd go within the next couple of days. So we said, you know, you, you got something going on there. And what my experience and what my first book, Angelic Attendance, what happens as we transition from this life into the next is all about is how we're surrounded by angels and the spirits of deceased loved ones and pets as we're transitioning. And there's university-based research that corroborates all of that now and says that 90% of people at the end of their lives do see deceased loved ones and the spirits of pets. Did you run into any of that? Every single time, every single time. And, you know, especially if they're not already in a comatose state, but, you know, usually two or three weeks before, oh, I keep seeing my husband in the corner and I'll be like, is he Bill? Yeah. And like, I, I'm seeing my German shepherd over here and I'm seeing my mother and um, all the time. And so even if they can't vocalize it to you, everybody, they do come to take them home. That's right. They do. And even if they can't say, you know, oh, but they'll hold their hands out and they reach up, right? Because they're absolutely seeing them. So I imagine, yeah, you, you already know that. Well, and, and it used to be that we all thought that Aunt Betty was just hallucinating and it was the morphine. And it's not. They're actually seeing them. And it's so comforting to the person who's transitioning, number one, but I find to the family as well, because when they know that they're surrounded by their loved ones and their beloved pets, it makes it a little bit easier for them to let go of their loved one. And also when we're with somebody at the end of their lives, whether we're cognizant of it or not, we're thinking, oh God, I'm going to be there one day. You know, what's going to happen next? And uh, and I think it, it makes us face our own mortality when we're with a loved one at the end of their lives. You have any thoughts on that? I do. And I, it's, this is a little side angle, but I also feel like when, when we have a significant loss, uh, sometimes our friends sort of fall off and your true core friends stay and they'll stand in the fire with you and they'll come because the others, they're facing their own mortality. And I've seen that a lot with child loss and my sister, when she physically lost her son, Sean, that a lot of her friend group, you know, would dissipated. And then the, the true core stayed with her because it was too hard. 
for them to deal with watching her and her loss because what if that happens to me? So I know it kind of went a left turn there, but right? So what do, what do we say to somebody like your sister when they've lost a child? Or what do we say to somebody who's lost a loved one, perhaps very suddenly and unexpectedly? Is, have you found that there are things that we can say that are, are more comforting than others? Well, I'll tell you what I say, but I'll give advice of what to say or not to say is um, what not to say is like, oh, well, you know, um, God needed him more or, um, you know, oh, they were so good they had to go. And, and my word of advice is keep their spirit alive. Keep talking about them. Go and sit and just be with somebody, especially with new loss. And don't be afraid to talk about them. They, they always say like, talk about me tell your best stories, like keep my memory alive because I'm right here. I'm not dead. I'm just different. Yeah. And, and so be with them, listen, check on them, bring them a meal. Don't ask because if you ask like, can I do anything for you? They're not going to tell you what to do. So just do these light little things where you, you know, leave a, a meal, leave some flowers, write a note and something like, these are my best stories about Ryan. This is what I remember most about little Kate, you know, or even your husband used to make me laugh with this, this, and this. And so keep their memory alive. That father slash husband that we talked to yesterday, my client and her three daughters and I, he asked them to make a toast to him at the Christmas dinner table. And he said, please save my chair for me. And, and his wife said, yeah, he always sat at the head of the table. You know, he loved being the boss. And he said, please leave my chair for me because I will be there sitting with all of you and make a toast, which was so sweet. And they loved it. They loved when he heard that. And, and then he started talking about cookies, you know, back to that ADD thing. Like later in the conversation, he was talking about cookies. And I said, all right, what's with the cookies? Was he the cookie monster? Were there certain cookies that he liked? And they said he started making cookies the last year of his life. And the problem was he would eat most of them before any of the rest of us could get to him. So he was saying to them, you know, make the cookies. And, you know, and, and I won't eat them all before you can get to them now because I don't need them anymore. But they, he was just cracking them up the whole time. The other thing that he said that I thought was really profound was it was obvious that he had changed his opinion about something, being in heaven now versus when he was alive. And he was talking about being a basketball coach for his kids and his grandkids. His, grand, his kids are all grown. So now lately he had been the basketball coach for the little grandchildren. And he said the most important thing was for them to have fun. And his family said, does he have anything to say about basketball? And of course, he came up with a couple of plays that, you know, they could implement. But he said the most important thing was for them to have fun because if the coach was stressing the kids out, the kids couldn't perform. But when they were having fun and they were loose and they were easy and having a ball, you know, then they'd make all kinds of baskets. And they all pretty much the same time were laughing, his family because they said he was the most uptight, stressed out, getting the kids stressed coach that there ever was in little kids sports. But that was his message from heaven to them was the most important thing for the kids was for them to have fun. Oh, see, I thought that was really profound. Have you come across something like that as well? Yeah, because I, they see more clearly. So they often say like, you know, I've, I've done this life review and I've sat in the shoulda, coulda, wouldas, or, you know, I wish I did this differently or this better. And um, a lot of folks here are now breaking the ancestral trauma and they're doing that for their children so they don't have to go through the lessons that we went through. But when you said that, he said, I, you know, we just want you to have fun because it's like, I can see clearly now, right? So that they know like the true meaning of the experience here, right? Right. Say more about the ancestral healing thing. I find that fascinating and I don't know much about it. Mm. 
So when uh, a lot of, for me, spirits come through and they'll, hold on, let me start old here. He's diabetic, so I'll have to go in about five minutes to give him his insulin. But mm, no, no, no. No, that's okay. I can do the question. No, because I have to bring no. So, okay, let me start that over. So I deal with a lot of folks who have had a lot of um, traumatic experiences. And, you know, I work also with the police and FBI on different cases. And I was just sitting with a, a mom. Um, the, and the only readings I do are free for parents who have lost children, but my wait list is full. But this woman, her daughter was murdered and she's like, I don't understand. And, you know, um, I said, she's like, but why did that happen? What was I supposed to learn? So I feel like there's always like this lesson, even if it's like super hard. And I said, well, those guys had free will and they went against like God will. And um, so it changed the course of things because she's like, I did not agree to this. So this is a whole other. I always go down a side lane. Right, Julie. And so. um, but ancestral trauma, like I just did a big group last night and I said to this guy, your dad's here and, um, you know, you were separated for many years and he wants to say sorry, but he, he said, I'm your teacher. We came into this incarnation that we agreed to go through really hard lessons so that your kids don't have to do it. So you decided I'm not going to be like him and I'm going to say, I love you and I'm going to be supportive and I'm not going to drink and I'm going to take what I witnessed and I'm going to turn it into a, a, a learning lesson and I'm going to break that trauma so that we don't keep repeating patterns and my kids don't have to experience to the level that, that, that we did or I did, right? Yeah. So does that go back and heal the generations that had lived previously and heal future generations. I understand the future generations, but I've heard several people say that it goes back and it heals those from past generations, our ancestors as well. It does. And it, it really ties back into what we were talking about with the past, present, future all happening simultaneously so that what you heal right now in this experience can, it, it has no you know, past, present, future, it, it, yeah, it's healed on many um, levels and it could even go to higher dimensions or lower vibrations and, and heal that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it has to do with the DNA too. I think that the DNA has memory yes. from ancestors and goes forwards and backwards too. There's, there's a DNA component there. Big time. Yes. Yeah. yeah I agree. Okay, a couple more questions as we're winding down. Why did we incarnate? So, you know, we, for me personally, I can recognize now um, that I have done a lot of work to get to a place where I can recognize patterns that um, I probably have taken in from other experiences, past lives, whatever. And um, we keep coming back to learn and grow and to reach closer to whatever your language is, everybody, to God or to um, enlightenment and just, you know, to really marinate in forgiveness and coming back to love and joy. And it's not, all, not always puppies and butterflies, but you can create a better experience with words like what do you need i need purpose i need clarity i need more joy and wisdom and um so we keep coming back to try to i guess be more grateful and learn these deep deep lessons so we don't keep repeating and i'm i i say like i agree to the triple whammy coming into this experience that that they were like hey we're gonna send you back and i was like you know what just give it all to me at once because i'm not gonna keep doing this and then it was like Went in. Goodness, that whole being in the hospital for three years as a child, my goodness. The fact that you that you were able to survive that is amazing in itself. And and still here to tell the tale and seemingly healthy now. Yeah. Don't be chewing on those windowsills with lead paint anymore. It tasted yeah. like candy. That is a true fact. And my little Irish mother decided to do something about it while I was in children's hospital in a coma. And she wrote up the lead paint poisoning preventive bill 
and got it passed on the state and federal level, went to Washington. We had no money. You know, we were the state cheese powder milk spam family, collected her $99 flight money, testified at the congressional lead paint hearing. Ted Kennedy stood up and said, uh, we don't have time for you, Mrs. Dalton. He told her off. She, I mean, she told him off. And then he passed the bill. So my mother's the reason why you can't sell your house. Wow. What a great story. God bless her. Wow. Wow. She got and, things done. Yeah. And God bless you for all the work that you do. You're just extraordinary. And the way that you present this spiritual stuff to families and to who've lost children and who are at the end of their lives because of disease or just in your normal hospice work, you bring so much comfort and enlightenment to people from all over. And, and, you know, through your TV shows and your books and stuff, I, I think you're just remarkable. So thank you for the work that you're doing. And right back at you. I think you're oh, awesome. Thank you. All righty, everybody. How can you learn more? How can people learn more about you and your work? So they can go to MaureenHancock.com, and I have an online university where you can learn about all things soul and spirit related. And I'm on Instagram, Media Maureen Hancock, on Facebook, the Maureen Hancock fan page. And I'm on TikTok, Carol Baskin. What's happening? Uh, Maureen Hancock, yeah. And I do a lot of retreats around the world. I'm heading out to Portugal in a couple of days. Yep. And I'm going to be in Sedona in April and May. Um, one with James Van Prague. So I love that smaller, intimate time when I get to do fun things too. Yeah, because it's all about having fun when spirit's working through us and with us, I find. It's, uh, yeah, it's all pure joy and love and fun. Okay, sending you lots of love, everybody from Sweet Home, Alabama. Mwah! And from Boston too, we'll see you next time. To enhance your spiritual journey, click on one of the videos below and remember to subscribe, leave a comment, and share with your family and friends.